Cardano is currently entering an era where we'll experience the good side of the short-term versus long-term payoff perception gap. What does that mean? Humans are very perceptive as to short-term benefits and very imperceptive as to the accumulation of long-term benefit. This can be observed on the micro scale. Your neighborhood will probably conclude that your neighbor who just took on colossal high interest debt to buy two new cars and a boat is a great success, while they are very unlikely to realize or appreciate that you are dollar cost averaging a good chunk of your paychecks into assets that may 10x in the next few years. It also happens even with high level academics on a macro scale throughout the Cold War. Western economists routinely predicted that the Soviet Union would outgrow the U.S. because they were optimizing short-term growth drivers at the expense of long-term economic expansion. Cardano has been doing the opposite and optimizing everything for long-term growth. Now it's our turn to reap the long-term payoffs. Ready? Let's go. Today, we will discuss long-term payoffs, a possible hint as to the Cardano November surprise, a sneak peek at the Cardano Summit 2022 NFTs, Caitlin Long's Custodia Bank getting a preliminary win, the proof of concept rollout of a US CBDC, basically, more FTX Alameda contagion, and a tiny update on the timing of the Pavia live event. If you see this image and think to yourself, I'm glad they're happily experiencing the payoff of summoning that giant rock, but let's take it easy with the jumping around. It does look slippery. Or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Humans have always been terrible at comparing competitors who optimize for growth on different timelines. They will always give greater value to the optimization of the drivers of short-term growth. I'm not exactly, I, I, th- I think part of it has to do with, I'm not exactly sure why this is, but I think part of it has to do with how much easier it is to perceive short-term growth. Just like your neighborhood is going to be convinced that your nearly bankrupt, debt-riddled neighbor is obviously doing extremely well because they just just acquired the boat and the two brand new cars. Just like that's the case, even much more sophisticated high-level academics have continuously given greater value to the optimization of short-term growth drivers over long-term growth drivers. Here we see an article from the Harvard Crimson, the Harvard newspaper on October 17th, 1960, deep in the heart of the Cold War, guys. This article says, Professor predicts Soviet Union growth will overtake US. Obviously that happened. The article says, if the American economy continues to grow at the present rate of about 3.5% a year, the Soviets will probably catch up to the United States in the 1980s. Abram Bergson, professor of economics, predicted at the Hillel Roundtable of World Affairs yesterday. And he did hedge his bets a little bit. He did hedge his bets a little bit. He said, there are certain retarding economic forces facing the Soviet Union. One of them will be the decline in available natural resources. Already two strikes, Professor Bergson. It is now it is now 62 years later, almost to the day. And the thing the Soviet Union, the former, the biggest former Soviet Republic is still very, very good at is exporting natural resources. They're still doing that like gangbusters. Turned out that was not the big driver of of uh, of of anti-growth for the Soviet Union. But this wasn't the case of a single isolated academic at Harvard. Even the textbooks were predicting that the Soviet Union would outgrow the United States. 
Paul Samuelson wrote in his textbook of economic principles in the 1961 edition that GNP in the Soviet Union was about half that in the United States, but the Soviet Union was growing faster. As a result, one could comfortably forecast that Soviet GNP would exceed that of the United States by as early as 1984 or perhaps by as late as 1997. You notice he's not predicting here that the Soviet Union would actually implode and cease to exist during that same time period. But that wasn't the only textbook. And even more off-course analysis can also be found in another mega-selling textbook, McConnell's Economics, still a huge seller today. McConnell estimated Soviet GNP as half that of the United States in 1963, but he showed that the Soviets were investing a much larger share of GNP and thus growing at rates two to three times higher than the U.S. Indeed, through at least 10 editions, the Soviets continued to grow faster than the U.S. And yet in McConnell's 1990 edition, Soviet GNP was still half that of of the United States. Obviously, that doesn't make sense. How could they have been growing so much faster than the US and still be just half the size of the US economy in 1990, almost 30 years later? So what's going on here? We know this is a normal condition of human perception. We always notice and acknowledge very strongly, identify very strongly, the drivers of short-term growth. If you leverage short-term growth, if you optimize for short-term growth, people are always able to detect that and notice it and predict that you will outgrow the competitor that's optimizing for long-term growth. Cardano has been a victim of this. Cardano from day one has made no secret about the fact that it was optimizing for long-term growth. We very early in the existence of of, uh, of of Cardano as an asset that existed in public ownership, we were taught having these discussions about how Africa was going to be the biggest growth area over you know like the next thirty years. That's some long term thinking. Meanwhile, I was constantly hearing from friends in real life who don't know about this channel, but know I'm involved with Cardano. They know I like Cardano. They know I'm a Cardano enthusiast. What I was constantly hearing from them was that I was making a gigantic mistake by not being more interested in things like Solana and the Terra Luna ecosystem, all of the centralized finance platforms, how I could get much better gains, much better gains than the Cardano staking gains if I would just deposit my assets in those central finance platforms. Why, why is it that in so many of these cases, we see all these prognostications that the best, the best strategy is going to end up being the short-term optimization strategy? I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think the parties that choose long-term opti optimization tend to be less showy. There's a whole lot less puffery self-promotion going on with those projects. I wouldn't say that Cardano has done a bad job of self-promotion, but in fact, I would say that Cardano has done a fantastic job of self-promotion. But there's also the other part. Even in the case of the long-term optimizers who do do an equally good job at self-promotion, they don't really have anything to show for it in the short term. In the short term, when you look at Solana's meteoric growth compared to Cardano's, you know, over the last, you know, little bit, maybe up until very, very recently, a lot of people would have concluded, in fact, a lot we know a lot of influencers on the other side of the fence were concluding that Solana was going to eclipse many, many ecosystems, including Cardano. And at times, you know, Solana and Cardano did seem to be neck and neck. But lo and behold, what has happened? Much like the short-term optimizer in the case of this Cold War case, Solana also imploded. Short-term optimization always comes at a cost. When you're the short-term optimizer, you always have to make some sacrifice of long-term benefit. And eventually, that catches up with you. Of course, Solana is an easy case to make because they've already imploded. 
we we already know we already know that bad things have happened to the Solana ecosystem. But I would also make this same case about short-term optimizers versus long-term optimizers in relation to Ethereum. I feel like Ethereum has done the same the same thing with short-term optimization to get them to proof of stake. Ethereum could have taken the time to come up with a self-custodied version of proof of stake like Cardano did, but that probably would have taken a lot longer, a much more straightforward path, a much quicker path, even though it still took them a long time to get to proof of stake. It's just to say, hey, uh, the way we're going to enforce good behavior is by slashing your funds if you engage in bad behavior. And of course, as we've discussed a million times on this channel, the way they accomplished the slashing part of that, the enforcement part, was by saying, hey, we're going to need to slash your funds if you are the validator or if you've delegated to a validator. We're going to be able to do that because we're going to make you give up custody of your funds. This was a short-term optimization. It probably would have taken, it may have, I'll say it may have taken them a lot longer to hash out a good strategy to achieve healthy proof of stake without slashing. If they decided to do something other than slashing, it may have taken them a lot longer to find a good system like Cardano has. Instead, they just went with the most straightforward, obvious thing. Let's just let's just make them give up their cust the custody of their assets and we'll slash them if they do anything we don't like. This is a short-term optimization. It's a much more straightforward path to proof of stake, but you're making a long-term sacrifice. If anybody wants to be involved in validation in your network now, and they don't have the requisite gigantic amount of Ethereum required to be a validator, they have to give up custody. That's a huge long-term sacrifice. And just like in all these cases, always seemingly of the long-term optimizer versus the short-term optimizer. Of course, people are just patting them on the back for finally getting to proof of stake. They finally got there. Everybody's so happy. But they've made, they've made a sacrifice that kind of sticks with them forever. This sacrifice of self-custody. Of course, the roles are reversed here because Cardano is actually the much smaller economy catching up to the larger economy in Ethereum. But still, we're definitely the long-term optimizer. Well, I would argue that they're the short-term optimizer. So basically, yeah, I'm saying Ethereum is the Soviet Union in this Cold War. I would also argue that Ethereum's institutionalization of MEV, maximal extractable value, formerly called minor extractable value was a sort of short-term optimization that also basically required a highly imprudent long-term sacrifice. But we've covered that a million times in this channel, so we won't dive back into that here. So basically, I'm saying that Cardano is the free world and Ethereum and Solana are basically in the position of Soviet republics in the Cold War as the short-term optimizers. But speaking of the free world, we got a sneak peek at the Cardano Summit 2022 NFTs with this post from Turf. They say the Cardano Summit 2022 NFTs are derived from their original NFTs. The color palette is different and so is the information shown on the cards. But other than that, they have the same features of a 3D NFT plus interactivity plus a high quality print file. And you can see it looks like, you know, maybe the color palette might be slightly different. Maybe it's black and white. Maybe it's something else. I'm also hearing that there will be 52 different NFTs, one for every community event, the main event and the virtual event. And there will be a 1% chance of an NFT being a gold edition, which means it comes with a free high quality print of the NFT. And these NFTs will be free except for a one ADA fee to cover minting costs. I'm actually looking forward to Turf's upcoming mint. I've always been a big fan of maps and I feel like there's some place on the world map for everyone that represents at least some some good chunk, some decent chunk of the essence of that person. And it looks like the way this, this is going to work is they've got a global map 
and you can go to any any parcel any pick any of the parcels on that world map and create an nft that's going to have a representation of that piece of the world along with some kind of a, a high quality file so you could actually print out this little chunk of the world and throw that up on your wall i think this is the kind of thing that might resonate with a lot of people that mint is going down december 1st at these times but if i'm remembering correctly i believe you have to register by the end of november and just so there's no confusion here we're talking about two different sets of nfts there's the turf mint that's happening on december 1st of their own nfts but turf is also helping with the mint of the cardano summit 2022 nfts the Cardinal Summit is happening this weekend. I don't know about you, but I love it when the good guys win in crypto, even if they're not in Cardano. And it looks like we're seeing at least a preliminary win for one of the good guys here. Caitlin Long's Custodia Bank has been, has been involved in this long struggle where they're trying to get things like routing numbers so they can do real bank things. But in order to have a routing number, a bank has to have a master account with the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve has not been forthcoming with these master accounts for crypto banks like Custodia Bank, uh, Kraken's Wyoming Bank is kind of in the same situation. So Caitlin Long's Custodia Bank sued the Federal Reserve saying, hey, we're a bank, we meet all the requirements, give us our master account, we want to do bank stuff. And to do that, we need a routing number. And of course, the Federal Reserve did what you'd expect. They immediately tried to get the suit dismissed. But it looks like Custodia Bank has scored a preliminary win here in, with the uh, with the court saying at this point, the court is confident in stating that basically the Federal Reserve exercises at least quasi agency functions that may render it subject to basically the normal set of regulations for uh, for an agency, a government agency. This is kind of a big question because there's always this this weird thing about the status of the Federal Reserve. Is it an agency? Is it a semi-governmental entity? And in this case, the court says, hey, uh, at least for purposes of whether or not the suit should be dismissed or the suit should be heard, it looks like you guys are doing stuff that looks enough like an agency here that we're going to say we should go ahead and hear this case. So congratulations on that to Caitlin Long and Custodia Bank. But that's not all the Federal Reserve System has been up to lately. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York dropped this press release where they said that they are going to participate in a proof of concept project to explore the feasibility of an interoperable network of central bank wholesale digital money and commercial bank digital money operating on a shared multi-entry distributed ledger. And the rest of the article is full of all kinds of euphemisms where they do the classic thing. Instead of calling it a blockchain of some type, they just say it's distributed ledger technology, the old DLT, the favorite euphemism in crypto. They did admit there's some time frame for this. It'll be a 12-week project. Does that sound like a testnet rollout of a wholesale CBDC? Don't worry, their Business Wire press release assures you that that is certainly not the case. They say this project will be conducted in a test environment and only use simulated data. It is not intended to advance any specific policy outcome, nor is it intended to signal that the Federal Reserve will make any imminent decisions about the appropriateness of issuing a retail or wholesale CBDC, nor how one would necessarily be designed. So they're assuring you that this is not going is not like immediately preceding the rollout of a CBDC, which makes me believe that this will immediately precede the rollout of a CBDC. Also, don't despair. You're probably worried. Hey, 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 are my favorite banks involved in this? Because I won't stand for it if my favorite banks aren't involved. Don't worry, your favorite banks are all involved. They've got BNY Mellon, City, HSBC, MasterCard, PNC Bank, TD Bank, Truist, US Bank, and Wells Fargo. They're all in there. Speaking of rollouts, we're continuing to see the expansion of the FTX Alameda contagion. Salt says, I am sorry to report that the collapse of FTX has impacted our business. Until we are able to determine the extent of this impact, they are pausing deposits and withdrawals. <laughs> we strongly advise against depositing. Of 
course they do because they are worried about their ability to pay back any funds. By the way, this is Salt Lending, not any entity in Cardano that goes by that name. This one that I very briefly mentioned yesterday actually sounds much worse. Unfortunately, I have some pretty bad news to share. Last week, Ikigai was caught up in the FTX collapse. We had a large majority of the hedge fund's total assets on FTX. Hear that? They had a large majority of the hedge fund's total assets on FTX. By the time we went to withdraw Monday morning, we got very little out. We're now stuck alongside everyone else. Finally, in the Cardano metaverse world, we're creeping up on the Pavia Plaza live event. Pavia Ross says, more live event work happening today. QA is well underway and we are finalizing plans for the big day. Everyone will have plenty of time to download the live event well ahead of time. Full details are to be released very soon. I'm looking forward to seeing what this whole Pavia world finally looks like. I hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.